morning everyone. I'm very happy to welcome you to this new NPTEL course entitled Postmodernism in Literature. This course is a 20 hour course spread across eight weeks of online learning and teaching. And this is now pitched at the postgraduate level. Though there are no prerequisites for this course, it's uh, quite advisable that you have a sense of familiarity with the various trends in English literary studies and also a familiarity with the ways in which uh, genres have been developing and literary historical periods have been uh, uh, categorized in uh, dominant canonical history. At the outset itself, I think it's very important to give you, an obje uh, give you a run through the major objectives of this course. The first objective is to facilitate an understanding of the category of the postmodern as a historical period, a cultural tendency and a dominant critical practice of the 20th century. I use these terms rather advisedly and I think it's important to, uh, to, to uh, give you an introduction to these terms and what I mean by these and how I propose to go about this course in order to achieve these ends. Firstly, we look at the postmodern period as a historical period. And when I say historical period, this refers to a particular kind of a period which is which has a beginning and, ha and has a, a kind of an ending at, uh, at another historical uh, setting. In, in continuation with the various historical trends and various historical periods, we try to present this particular phenomenon known as postmodernism in the post-war period. And when I say post-war, I have in mind the post-World War. So in that sense, a historical sense would be the period after 1945. And secondly, we look at postmodernism as a cultural tendency. And this is very significant because postmodernism cannot be limited in a very historical sense. This is also a dominant uh, a cultural tendency, a sort of a cultural trend, which was evident in most of the disciplines and most of the practices of the 20th century. And thirdly, we look at postmodernism as a dominant critical practice. When I say critical practice, I have in mind also the intellectual tendencies of the 20th century and also the various phenomena which came together to describe 20th century life in general. In this context, let me uh, also add that postmodernism now is considered as a, uh, an, an oft used term and also a very ambiguous term of the 20th century. And this is used in diverse ways to talk about multiple things related to 20th century life in general. The second objective that we have is to introduce the learners to the different philosophical and critical frameworks within which the idea of postmodernism is located. Though the event of postmodernism, the phenomenon of postmodernism could be located in various disciplines and various sites, our thrust, our focus as part of this course is to talk about the intellectual tendencies to trace the genealogy of the intellectual trends in the 20th century. So in that sense, it's, it becomes very important to give a philosophical and critical understanding of this term and also place it within the dominant intellectual uh, and literary critical aspects. So we uh, propose to do this in multiple ways and one of those ways is to uh, trace the genealogy of the term through a, a survey of uh, major sites, major literary works which have tried to define this term, the major theorists of the 20th century who have offered a commentary of this term and also try to place all of them within a, a single framework. Though postmodernism cannot be uh, limited to a single definition, we here try to uh, uh, form a systematic discussion based on uh, the various sorts of things written about postmodernism, the various uh, intellectual framework uh, proposed uh, uh, regarding postmodernism in the 20th century. So the third objective is to present postmodernism in the way it is reflected, manifested and represented in 20th century literary sites. The title of this course, if you remember, is Postmodernism in Literature. So even when we begin with a general survey, a general historical understanding, a general mapping of the intellectual uh, trends uh, related to postmodernism, we would eventually narrow this down to a discussion of literary sites. And when I say literary sites, I have a range of things in mind. It could be literary texts, it could be uh, particular kinds of genres, it could also be certain movements, certain uh, major uh, artistic trends that emerged in the 20th century. So in that sense, we shall be looking at schools, movements, different aspects of thought and also particular texts such as uh, novels, poetry, drama uh, and uh, uh, various commentaries and essays written and even some of the, uh, some of the uh, dialogues which were very dominant, some of the debates which were very dominant in the 20th century. Having said all of this, the final objective is 
related to our all, all the themes of discussion and also uh, in, in, in certain ways adding to the general critical acumen of the learners. The fourth objective in that sense is to enable the learners to critically engage with texts, ideas, debates and paradigms in literary studies. So here we move on to a different level altogether by facilitating a sort of a, a critical training so that the students, so that the learners can also uh, know how to engage across these various sites of intellectual trends, of historical periods, of dominant uh, cultural tendencies and how to relate them with particular texts and particular contexts, how uh, various debates have been uh, uh, framed in literary history and how various paradigms emerged at particular points of time in connection with these dominant trends, tendencies and practices. With these four objectives put together, we move on to make sense of this entire course entitled Postmodernism in Literature. So this also brings us to this question, where, where, which are the sites where we can identify postmodernism in? Where do we find postmodernism getting manifested? Uh, this uh, question is also important because when we talk about other aspects of uh, literary studies, when we talk about particular periods of the uh, previous centuries such as Romanticism or for example uh, certain aspects related to realism or aspects related to pastoral poetry if you take a more uh, 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 precise term. So we can say that there are particular texts, there are particular sites where these sorts of uh, movements, these, uh, these uh, ideas and these uh, dominant tendencies could be seen. Uh, more uh, prominently. But however, when we come to an understanding of postmodernism, we find that this is spread across a range of things. So those who are familiar with a general uh, idea of how the contemporary has been defined in the last few decades, we would also know that postmodernism is perhaps the most uh, used term to talk about most of the practices within uh, 20th century uh, literature, culture, art, you name anything and anything about postmod anything about the 20th century perhaps will fit into this framework related to postmodernism. So in that sense, we can identify the, the aspects of postmodernism in architecture and many are also of the opinion that just like the modernist period, even during the postmodernist period, archi uh, architecture is a site where these changes were seen uh, in, in a more immediate fashion, in a more concrete way. And this is also evident in the way history has been written, the history has been uh, rewritten and also positioned in, in, in during the various uh, periods of the 20th century. Postmodernism could also be traced through the various discussions within the discipline of philosophy and uh, philosophical engagements with this term postmodernism, with the idea of postmodernism is also something that we would begin to look at this of course uh, in, 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 in rather uh, detail. And there's also uh, postmodernism in general art, this could include various kinds of arts including painting, sculpturing and uh, it, it could also include uh, multiple forms of uh, uh, even digital and non-digital uh, uh, art in the 20th century as well. And we find this, uh, the ideas of postmodernism also changing the ways in which social and political theory has uh, been framed in the 20th century. And more importantly, and especially for a very popular and common understanding of postmodernism, it's important to look at the ways in which uh, postmodernism gets reflected in many forms of cultural production. Especially, this is very, very evident in 20th century cinema and also in the different kinds of pop music, rock music and various genres of music available uh, today. And uh, there, there is also a way in which postmodernism could be seen as uh, something which generally philosophical, aesthetic and ideological uh, questions are asked about because uh, this is not merely about certain manifestations, it is also about how uh, this idea, the idea of uh, postmodernism enables us to ask particular questions about the 20th century art, about 20th century culture and placing them within philosophical, aesthetic and ideological realms. And uh, coming to the, the particular turf that we are addressing as part of this course, we also have uh, various aspects of literary theory and criticism being uh, influenced by the aspects of postmodernism. And we also have literature in general, which could again mean a wide variety of genres, sub genres and different forms and different kinds of writings available from uh, all parts of the world. And here we also need to make uh, one particular distinction when we talk about literature. In uh, So far when we had been talking about uh, the history of literature, we are focusing mostly on literature written in English. But in the postmodern period, we realize that it is about literatures 
written not just in English but also in various other languages, in translations from different parts of the world, from different cultures. And there are also this visibility being given to different forms without privileging one over the other. So overall perhaps it would just suffice to say that postmodernism provides us with a new organizing principle in thought, action and reflection and this is also connected to many changing factors in modern society. So this is very important because when we talk about most of the other realms or most of the other related aspects of literary studies, we do not find them always connecting well with uh, the, the, the real life, the real modern uh, contemporary life. But in the case of postmodernism, here is a term we have which could be used for intellectual discourse and also to talk about certain very mundane aspects of day-to-day uh, -day contemporary life. And also as part of this course, it also becomes very, very important to identify the sort of terms that we are using and the meanings designated to it. If you notice in the course, we have used the term postmodernism and not postmodernity. So we do have a very conscious distinction in mind between postmodernism and postmodernity. The general agreement is that we can identify a shift from postmodernity to postmodernism in the sense that there is a shift from the general frame of reference, postmodernity being more general in nature. We find a shift from the general frame of reference to, a more, to more limited aesthetic realms. So as part of this course, what we are looking at is a set of limited aesthetic realms. We are not talking about postmodernity in general, we are not talking about life in general, culture in general, but we are limiting our discourse, we are limiting our discussion to certain aesthetic realms which could be mapped and covered within the gamut of a course. And it's also important to then uh, spend a little time talking about what postmodernity is. Postmodernity is a term used to refer to the general postmodern culture in the 20th century. And this could be a, 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 a this could be used as a general frame to talk about the changing scheme of things, not just in art, culture, and such very profound things, but also about lifestyle in general. It could mean a range of things. When we say the lifestyle has become postmodern, it could mean that it has changed radically from the modernist times. It could also mean that it's more contemporary in nature, that it defies all conventions, and that it is very difficult to classify it. It has also been increasingly used as a term to talk about things when they do not really fit within any particular definition or any particular category. And postmodernity, as we have mentioned, this is nowadays used mostly to refer to the general development of the 20th century, regardless of a particular uh, idea, regardless of a particular discipline or regardless of one particular scheme of things. It's a uh, it's a general reference which we shall be avoiding throughout this course. We shall be focusing more on this term postmodernism. So, when we talk about postmodernism, what comes to our mind is a set of theories, of frameworks, and these are all important because they make they help us to make sense of the postmodern age. So, one of the objectives of this course is also perhaps to make sense of this term known as postmodernism through a discussion of a series of texts being made available to us. And when we talk about postmodernism, again, we also talk about a, 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 certain, a certain literary schools. Maybe we cannot talk about a single literary movement or a logical linear progression of ideas and uh, the presentation of texts. But nevertheless, we are talking about schools of thought, we are talking about critical paradigms. And we are also talking about development in, developments in culture and arts and mostly the, the kind of developments which could be identified in particular texts, particular movements and literary tendencies. And these significantly are not too general. These are things which could be narrowed down to particular aspects as genres, as uh, uh, dominant practices, as uh, uh, popular culture. So we have moved from postmodernity to postmodernism. We have moved from the general towards more limited particular understandings and limited discourses and limited uh, uh, frameworks. And when I say limited, this is not in the negative sense at all. This is also to make sense of the term, make sense of this academic uh, pursuit within the gamut of a uh, of, of a particular course.
So when we talk about uh, postmodernism and when we say that this is an intellectual framework that we are talking about, that this is a, an academic discourse and a, and, and a series of uh, uh, similar trajectories that we are dealing with, we are also made aware of the fact that postmodernism is a continuation of the more radical aspects of your American modernism. And uh, instantly this was the same sort of modernism which was prevalent in the British Isles as well. And uh, here the term continuation deserves a little more attention because uh, even as part of literary history, even as part of literary critical studies, uh, one of the things that English literary studies focuses on is the aspect of continuity, the aspect of um, tradition as Eliot would put it, uh, which has been inherently built into all kinds of literary productions. So even when we approach postmodernism, it's very important for us to see the continuity uh, within which it's also located. So maybe this is also a continuation of the radical aspects of modernism. And for example, we can talk about reflexivity and irony, which were part of the modernist trends as well. But on the other hand, maybe this is not just continuity. Maybe there is also a sense of rupture which, you know, which uh, emerges. Maybe there is a sense of rupture that emerges with postmodernism. And maybe, uh, for example, there, is, uh, there are dominant tendencies related to the mo modernist ahistorical bent or the uh, yearning for autonomy and closure. So this could be either a continuation from the modernist period or it could be a rupture from some of the aspects related to modernism. And uh, coming to the question of what exactly constitutes postmodernism, which are the sites which would most uh, perfectly uh, present the aspect of postmodernism, perhaps we have no uh, single easy answer. Whether it's uh, aspects of the, the architecture, the illusory kind of architecture, whether it's a kind of uh, uh, digital painting popularized by Andy Warhol, whether those are the particular kinds of readings of literary texts or postmodern art or kinds of uh, uh, poetry exemplified in the beat generation or the general sense of architecture itself, we do not know what sort of uh, uh, site represents the, represent the idea of postmodernism in the most perfect form in the 20th century. And I am not even sure whether we would attempt to answer these questions as part of this course because the, the intention is not to find an answer for the perf answer uh, for which are the perfect sites of uh, postmodernism, but what are the ways in which postmodernism gets reflected, gets manifested in 20th century disciplines and uh, different uh, art forms. Here I also take you through a brief journey through a, a certain uh, sites, certain uh, texts, certain uh, figures and certain movements identified as predominantly postmodernist, certain iconic moments if I may put it that way within this postmodern uh, trajectory. So the first thing that would come to our mind is perhaps uh, Marcel Duchamp's uh, idea of conceptual art, the sort of installations that he had in mind, the way in which during the modernist period, Marcel Duchamp lived during the modernist period in history. So we are also talking about the ways in which Marcel Duchamp transformed certain very ordinary things into art. Maybe the most shocking and the most controversial installation that he had uh, as part of his uh, conceptual art exhibition in the early 20th century is uh, this exemplary work now known as The Fountain. What Duchamp did was, as most of you know, during the modernist period, he shocked the entire art world by placing an inverted urinal as part of a, an art exhibition. And he also had named it R but R-M-U-T-T and this happened in 1970 and he also had done a very cheap reworking of the, of the postcard image of uh, Mona Lisa by, uh, by giving her an additional uh, decoration of a moustache and also giving a, a, a title L-H-O-O-Q which reportedly is also a vulgar expression talking about the sexuality of Mona Lisa and uh, many uh, keeping these details aside Many are of the opinion in the contemporary that Marcel Duchamp perhaps was responsible for opening the road to the postmodern predicament. 
So whether it's a predicament or a sort of a thing to be celebrated in the contemporary, it's a question that we'll come back to discuss at a later point. But now I hope you're getting all, you're also getting a sense of what postmodernist art is, what not to expect as postmodern art, how postmodern art deliberately defies all kinds of conventions, and how there's a way in which the ordinary, the mundane. And the otherwise non-arty elements and the non-arty objects are immediately transformed into very worthy uh, art installations or very uh, pricey pictures. And also in architecture where this is the most evident, we find a very direct transformation from the modernist dictum less is more towards Robert Venturi's claim that less is a bore. During the postmodern times, we also find a very irreverent rejection of many of the modernist trends which were seen as uh, dictums. So in, uh, in postmodern architecture, it said that you know we can also find a, uh, a coming together of the classical elements and the modernist elements to celebrate our ornamentation, to celebrate the decoration, which was seen as a completely obnoxious thing during the modernist times because they were advocates of the modernist architects were advocates of a, a minimalist sense in uh, all, all, all kinds of their execution. So in the 1970s uh, we find within this phase of architecture most of these architects moving away from the functional doctrines of modernism towards a more decorative, towards a more pronounced, towards a more loud form of uh, projections. And in continuation with uh, this, it's also important to recollect how there's a transition from Le Corbusier's toward an architecture towards Robert Venturi's uh, complexity and contradiction in architecture. And uh, the, the, while this work was published in the 1920s, we find complexity and contradiction of architecture getting published in 1966. And we find this transition becoming very important, very seminal and also underlying a transition in most of the other aspects related uh, to 20th century art and architecture as well. So to quote Ro Robert Venturi, I speak of a complex and contradictory architecture based on the richness and ambiguity of modern experience, including the experience which is inherent in art. I like elements which are hybrid rather than pure, compromising rather than clean, accommodating rather than excluding. I am for messy vitality over obvious unity. An architecture of complexity and contradiction must employ, must embody the difficult unity of inclusion rather than the easy unity of exclusion. So look at these very interesting terms. Hybrid, compromising, accommodating, messy vitality, complexity, contradiction, difficult, inclusion. Those were not terms which were in vogue during the modernist period. In fact, the modernists almost feared all these things which they, they, they thought were almost nearing them in the 20th century. They were also uh, reacting against the various aspects of the 20th century. They were also reacting against the uh, aspects of war, the, 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 the mortality of the 20th century, uh, uh, various political and economic phenomena. But at the same time, we find the modernists struggling to bring in a certain sense of unity, which is completely rejected in a very irreverent fashion by architects such as Robert Venturi. And this also becomes a certain uh, kind of a post-modernist uh, trend itself, uh, moving out of the sphere of architecture to various other disciplines and various other art forms and also into a general uh, lifestyle of 20th century itself. And uh, continuing with Robert Venturi for uh, a few more minutes, we also find that they came up with together Robert Venturi, Dennis Scott Brown, who also happens to be his wife, and Stephen Eisenhower. In 1972, they published another uh, important iconoclastic work, Learning from Las Vegas. And here they also made a very uh, significant distinction between ducks and decorated sheds. And ducks were, according to them, very, very modernist. And uh, in, in the, that was the sort of spaces in which architectural system of space and program are submerged and distorted by an overall symbolic form. Yeah. So if you remember, the modernists were more concerned about the symbolic form, not just in architecture, but also in various forms of writings. And in decorated sheds, which are more of a mid 20th century phenomenon, more of a postmodern phenomenon, uh, Robert Venturi argues, where systems of space and structure are directly at the service of program and ornament is applied independently. 
So ornament was seen as an obnoxious thing, as something to be rejected during the modernist period. And this idea of the decorated sheds become more celebrated in the postmodern period. And not just in the space of architecture, I reiterate, but also across various forms of writings, various forms of culture, and even the general lifestyle. And keeping in tune with this sort of rejection, with this sort of irreverence, and the unconventional techniques used in uh, art and architecture, when we come to the space of literature, we find that this similar kind of an attitude is reflected. So here uh, we I briefly introduced to you a, a very significant work published in 1969 by Kurt uh, Vonnegut. It was titled Slaughterhouse 5 or Children's Crusade, A Duty Dance with Death. So here we have a protagonist, Billy Pilgrim, and this uh, work is also a celebration of non-linear events and it also deliberately employs an unreliable narrator. But here, I want to introduce to you another significant aspect about this work. Uh, let's read, the, read, read this out together. There are almost no characters in this story and almost no dramatic confrontations because most of the people in, our, in it are so sick and so much the listless playthings of enormous forces. One of the main effects of war, after all, is that people are discouraged from being characters. So here, we have a novel which does not pretend to be oblivious to the fact that it is a novel. So here is a complete rejection of the ideas of the willing suspension of disbelief, which literature so celebrated in the Romantic and even during the Victorian period. So here we find a complete rejection of whatever we had understood as part of literature, a complete rejection of uh, the, the ideas of uh, uh, storytelling that we had. And here we have an author addressing the readers and telling us that there are no characters in the story and that the characters are so sick and that they are discouraged from being characters. A sense of an agency is being given to the characters and there is no omniscient, omnipotent, uh, uh, reliable narrator who is controlling these characters over here. There's only one of the samples that I'm presenting before you and we, uh, we, would, we would be certainly having a lot of discussions about these interesting texts in, in, the, in the coming uh, weeks. And another important uh, text, another, another sample text that I want to introduce to you as part of how postmodernism manifests in 20th century is a very impressive uh, work by Italo Calvino, If on a Winter's Night a Traveller. So this uh, title itself is very unconventional, it's a very challenging title and if you notice this is not even on title case, the entire title is on a, uh, it's written out on a sentence case and even in the original work it is um, presented in the same way, it, uh, we have a title of a novel in sentence case totally defying the conventions of how novels or even texts could be named. This work published in 1979 by Italo Calvino, an Italian writer, it's a perfect example of postmodern metafiction. And these are some of the terms that we shall be coming back to talk about in detail. And this work, If on a Winter's Night a Traveller, is about a reader trying to read a book called If on a Winter's Night a Traveller. So it's about a story within a story, a story very conscious of the fact that it is a story. And Conventionally, all stories are written either in the first person narrative or in the third person narrative. These are some of our, this is perhaps one of the earliest lessons that we are taught about stories and about storytelling. But here we have Calvino completely challenging even the fundamental aspect of storytelling by narrating a story in the second person narrative. So how does it work then? So here is the beginning paragraph from uh, Calvino's novel, If on a Winter's Night a Traveller. You are about to begin reading Italo Calvino's new novel, If on a Winter's Night a Traveller. Relax, concentrate, dispel every other thought, let the world around you fade. Best to close the door, the TV is always on in the next room. Tell the others right away, no, I don't want to watch TV. Raise your voice, they won't hear you otherwise. I'm reading, I don't want to be disturbed. Maybe they haven't heard you with all that racket. Speak louder, yell, I'm beginning to read Italo Calvino's new novel. Or, if you prefer, don't say anything, just hope they leave you alone. So who is the character here? Right at the outset, we get to know that this is a very direct reference to the reader. So the reader is the protagonist, reader is the main character of this novel. So how much more interesting can it, this get? So Calvino is totally challenging the ways 
in which the story is supposed to be told. He is challenging the reader, he is challenging the text, he is challenging the very fact that the story is not about something else. The story is not about somebody else. The story is about you, about the, uh, about the reader. So these are some of the things that we shall be taking a look at as part of this course. We shall be looking at how these various aspects have been theorized and why on earth somebody had to use such a technique to talk about something happening in the 20th century. There have also been multiple ways in which many have attempted to theorize postmodernism, to define postmodernism. In fact, one of the important works that we shall also be looking at uh, later in detail is a work named Postmodern Condition published in 1979 by Lyotard. And in this work, he gives a definition of postmodernism, which has also been generally accepted as one of the uh, significant uh, uh, commentaries about the idea of postmodernism. The object of this study is the condition of knowledge in the most highly developed societies. I have decided to use the term postmodern to describe that condition. The word is in current use on the American continent. It designates the state of our culture following the transformations which have altered the game rules of for science, literature and the arts. Simplifying to the extreme, I define postmodern as incredulity toward meta-narratives. So we've seen, we've uh, taken a look at a series of things where postmodernism is manifested and we also have uh, seen how some of them have attempted to define postmodernism. So this course is about a journey through these various sites where postmodernism has uh, uh, got reflected, uh, has uh, manifested and also how various aspects of postmodernism is uh, practically used and also about these sort of texts such as Leotard's uh, text and uh, Bath's text and a number of others who have attempted to uh, give commentaries, to give uh, descriptions, to attempt uh, definitions about the postmodern age. So coming to the end of our discussion today, I also wind up this, with this uh, caveat that postmodernism is not an organized movement with leaders and central figures. Throughout our discussion, we, we would see a, a, a complete absence of one particular figure emerging or one particular side being privileged as the postmodernist, uh, uh, the postmodernist uh, element. And postmodernism is also a site which deliberately rests definitions and classification. So though we would be making a number of attempts to define, a number of attempts to talk about the term and frame this in various aspects, we would see that postmodernism would continue to defy all of these attempts and would uh, not lend itself to a single sort of a definition or a single framework for classification. And throughout these discussions, we would also see that there is very little agreement on the precise nature, the characteristics and the manifestations of postmodernism. We would only have a, a general a trend being visible, a general uh, a sort of a genealogy un, 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 uh, being unraveled. Otherwise, it would be a rather difficult exercise to pin it down to particular elements, to particular characteristics. Nevertheless, throughout this course, through a journey of uh, particular texts, particular tendencies and uh, dominant uh, uh, trends and the characteristics, we should also be trying to map the terrain called postmodernism. So in the next few lectures, we shall be talking about postmodernism in literature in greater detail and uh, delving into uh, deeper into the text, deeper into the various phenomena and also critically analyzing the texts and domains available to us. Thank you for listening and I look forward to seeing you in the next class.